fibrillation. Tissue fluid is formed at the arterial end of the capillary because the blood pressure or the hydrostatic pressure of the blood exceeds the osmotic pressure. Therefore, tissue fluid is exuded from the arterial end of the capillary. Recall that in the normal situation, at the venous end of the capillary, when hydrostatic pressure, that is when blood pressure has dropped, the osmotic pressure of the blood, generated largely by the plasma proteins, is greater than the hydrostatic pressure in the venous end of the capillary. Therefore, tissue fluid is osmotically sucked back into the venous end of the capillary to give the circulation of tissue fluid. And if you want more detail on that, it's on the first video in this series, video number one. Now, in hemorrhage, though, the blood pressure has dropped. Therefore, the blood pressure in the capillaries is low. And the, the pressure of the blood, even at the arterial end of the capillary, can be lower than the osmotic pressure. And the pressure of the blood at the venous end of the capillary will certainly be significantly lower than the osmotic pressure. What this means is that all the way along the length of the capillary, after hemorrhage, is that the blood pressure is lower than the osmotic pressure. This means that there will be a net movement of fluid from the interstitial spaces, from the tissue fluid, back into the blood. So initially, if someone's just lost some blood, the concentration of the blood won't be altered. The hematocrit, that is the amount of red cells compared to the amount of fluid, will be the same because the person has lost whole blood. They've lost cells and they've lost fluids. The amount of salts, the amount of sodium in the blood, would be the same as normal. It's the blood volume which has been lost. But the pressure drops in the capillaries. Because the pressure has dropped in the capillaries, the osmotic pressure sucks blood back into the, sorry, the osmotic pressure sucks fluid back into the blood from the tissue spaces. So the osmotic pressure sucks fluid from the tissue spaces back into the blood. Now, if you're sucking fluid back into the blood, what will that do to blood volume? Well, if you're sucking fluid back into the blood, that will restore blood volume. Blood volume will be restored. And remember, blood volume is essential for blood pressure. Therefore, the blood pressure will increase again. And this will take a few hours after the blood has been lost. So that means that sometime after hemorrhage, then the blood will be uh, less osmotic and the hematocrit will be lower because the fluid is replaced fairly quickly to restore the volume of the blood. Depends on the amount of blood that's lost, actually. If it's uh, 500 mils of blood or something like that, then the spleen can fairly rapidly restore the amount of red cells as well. So the hematocrit should return to normal fairly quickly. So when blood is lost, fluid is sucked back in from the tissue spaces to restore blood volume. So again, it's like a reserve of fluid because it's so important that blood volume is maintained to maintain blood pressure, therefore to maintain the perfusion of all the organs of the body and to maintain life, to carry oxygen around the body. This is absolutely crucial. Now again, if fluid is sucked from the tissue spaces into the blood, that will increase the osmolarity of the tissue spaces, of the fluid in the tissue space, the interstitial fluid. Therefore, again, that will suck some more reserve fluid out from the cells. Some more water from the cells will go into the tissue space to uh, restore the volume, partly restore the volume of the tissue fluid. So another application of the compartmentalization of body fluids. So when there's hemorrhage, there's a drop in capillary blood pressure. That is a drop in hydrostatic pressure. The osmotic pressure though, of the blood remains the same, as does the hematocrit, because whole blood has been lost. Fluid is not formed at the arterial end of the capillary because the hydrostatic pressure is now less than the osmotic pressure. Osmotic suction from the blood, that says of blood, it should be from the blood, Osmotic suction from blood 
sucks water in from the tissue spaces. So osmotic suction from the blood sucks water from the tissue fluid back into the intravascular compartment. Therefore, blood volume is restored. Because there's fluid loss from the tissue fluid, that again will increase the osmotic pressure of the tissue fluid because water is lost really from the tissue fluid and increases the osmotic pressure of the tissue fluid. So fluid is osmotically sucked in from the cells of the body to help replenish the volume of the tissue fluid. Now you remember probably from previous videos or from other reading that there's quite a few parameters in the body which must be homeostatically controlled. Homeo, same, stasis, state of, must be maintained at the same state. For example, body, uh, body temperature, if someone gets too hot or too cold, that is corrected. Blood sugar levels, if they go too high or too low, they're corrected. Hormone levels in the blood, if they go too high or too low, they're corrected. And in a similar way, there's a balance of water in the body that must be maintained. Not too much and not too little. So just before we go and look at these mechanisms of how this is controlled, let's just look at why body, how water is gained and how water is lost from the body. So if we think about uh, water gains, first of all, how does water get in? Well, the most obvious way is that we drink water. Maybe, depends on the conditions, 1.5 litres of water a day, drank as fluid, cups of tea, things like that. It's interesting, actually, most people probably don't drink enough water. It's a good idea to drink plenty of water as long as, as, long as everything is healthy. This is probably especially true in hot countries because if the amount of water that you drink uh, is low, then the urine volumes will also be low and the urine will become more concentrated as a result. And this makes things like urinary tract infections more likely to occur, especially in females. And it also makes urinary precipitation more likely to occur. That is, there may be small stones formed in the ureters, uh, in the bladder, and these can give rise to significant problems, very, very painful conditions, and uh, can also lead to really quite severe infections. Whereas if you're drinking plenty of water, then the urine is fairly dilute, so the bacteria are physically flushed out of the urinary system and out of the urethra. And because the urine is fairly dilute, there's no precipitation of calculi from the urine and the person is less likely to get um, bladder stones and kidney stones and things like that. So drinking extra water is usually quite a good idea for most people. But I've put 1.5 litres here as a, an average. In hot countries it would be more, it depends. It's a random, just a random figure, really. But when we eat food as well, there's about a litre in food from food we eat. Most food contains a fair amount of water. And also from the food we eat, me metab metabolic processes liberate some water as well, sometimes called metabolic water. Okay, so that comes from the food. So water in fluid, water present in food, and water generated as a result of chemical reactions of the food once it's been ingested. And that is the only ways that we, uh, certainly in the ways I can think of, that we gain fluid in the normal situation. Obviously, you could give it intravenously in the clinical situation. Now, how is fluid uh, lost? Well, quite a lot is breathed out via the lungs um, because the air we breathe out uh, is much more, uh, contains much more moisture, more water vapour than the air we breathe in. So maybe something like half a litre a day is lost from the lungs. 
Now, of course, we sweat, 